So hello, I uh, am deeply grateful to both be back in Seattle, Seattle Children's, which I love for everything it did for me and for everything it does for children and families. Uh, I am standing up here realizing that I have committed one of the cardinal acts that I promised myself I would never do, which is to try to follow John Lantos. <laughs> Uh, you know, his wisdom and his drollness, uh, I was thinking in my mind of having like a droll off at some point, <laughs> see whether I could keep pace with his ability to in a, capture with both humor and deep insight some of the conundrums that we face and want to gloss over. I'm going to build on what John did. I didn't realize it would work quite this way, but let me start instead of just giving you another case. How many of you, when you were listening to John present the case of that young woman and all of the debate raging in the ethics committee got fired up in some way? Anybody get fired up just a little bit? Like a sense of arousal, of distress, of uh, a sense of righteousness? Anybody? Okay. How many of you do ethics consults where you walk into the room and have to talk to a family that is upset, angry, bereaved? This is my day job. This happens to be a depiction of Ugolino, Count Ugolino, who was incarcerated and featured in Dante's Inferno, incarcerated with his three children, three boys, and left to starve to death in a tower. And so often I walk into the room and the family is trying to provide care as best they know how to a child who is not doing well and they are besides themselves with a mixture of grief, despair, anger. And often what comes at me is some emotion that is almost overwhelming. I've had one father in particular, a child was languishing in the aftermath of a set of complications, again, as John had sort of sketched, the toxic therapy that was trying to combat the toxic disease, but unfortunately, it was the therapy's side effects that were really waging their heavy toll. And the father looked at me and said, your hospital did this. You are going to do what we say now. How many of you have ever encountered that kind of Ire. Yeah. Has it been easy to remain calm, cool, and collected? No. And even in an ethics committee where we couldn't be safer, I mean, we probably even have a cup of coffee in front of us, and yet we get so fired up. What I want to think about with you is not what the right answer was in John's case, although I have opinions about that, and I'm so keen to sort of like let them leak out. I'm going to keep that suppressed. Um, because the point of this talk is really not what the right answer is, but how to be in a space of great emotional roiling feelings and remain calm enough that you don't freak out, at least not too much, that more over time you don't burn out and that while doing it you can continue to have some fun because trust me, parents will also pick up on whether you love your job or having fun with it, even in the really tough situations, or whether you just don't really like this at all. And at the same time, a word that John used, to be kind, and I'm going to add this word, courageous. I have no qualifications to give this talk, <laughs> um, no formal qualifications, uh, other than having done a lot of these consults and over the last, since 2008, where we started a, a much more robust consult service where we do about 40 a year, uh, learned the hard way that this is in many ways more important than what I know about bioethics is how I can get balanced enough to be able to use what I know and what I don't know to help the process of deliberation and making good decisions move forward. So, in 2015, there's an ongoing debate about what is the work of ethics consultation, efforts to try to professionalize the field, people raging on one side that we have to become more uh, precise in how we're qualifying people in terms of certification and standards. On the other hand, people saying, we don't even know what we're doing. How do we go about, we don't agree on what we should be doing. How do we quantify and, and make that uh, a firm process? 
But amidst all of that, there's a little bit of hinting that mediation plays a part in it, i.e. more the process engagement of how you might have skills. I want to take that a little bit further and say one of the biggest parts of ethics consultation is managing the following. That because consults typically arise when there's conflict between people or tension between differing points of view, and that thinking, feeling, and then relating to other people, relating to our own thoughts and feelings, sometimes which are at war within ourselves, and sometimes it's relating to people who are around us, that because they're all dynamically connected, the work of ethics consultation can't just be about the thinking part. It can't be. And in fact, the more difficulties we encounter, the less important the thinking is. My strong thesis, forget the thinking. The problem is the emoting and the relating. The thinking is actually chasing after those two, trying to clean it all up. This is the delicate triangle that we need to be focused on. Even in the delicate triangle of me, the child, and the parent. And I would put it in that order, by the way. It's always me and the child. I don't believe in <coughs> gas, family-centered care. I believe in patient-centered care <laughs> with family engagement. I sometimes wonder if I were like my dad was over the last year in a two-person room in the hospital when he was sick and somebody walked in and said, we're doing room-centered care today. <laughs> we're going to interview both of you and see you know, pretty much what we think is the right thing to do for the room. People would be offended. <laughs> Indeed, if they came in and it was just me and my dad and said, we're going to do family-centered care, Chris, what do you need today? And didn't talk to my dad. I think he would have, well, there were days he, he wouldn't have minded that because he was so uncomfortable. But he would not have found that to be the right way to go. I do believe in family engagement, so don't mishear what I am saying. But this delicate triangle exists both as we walk into a room and are dealing with other people and also within ourselves. The problem is that we get no help in terms of training to figure out how to manage this. Uh, if you think about in medical school what we are taught, I would say that basically the cognitive emphasis is almost the entirety emotional emphasis very small, yes, I made the data up, but you know, roll with it. Um, and yet what affects our behavior when you, again, you're not gonna be able to get a pie chart for this, but when you look at the data on long-term implications of emotional intelligence and one's ability to succeed in life, to be able to have good relationships, uh, you look at all of the behavioral economics data that is coming out, which is basically old wine in new bottles, but is very well packaged, of basically reminding us of the fact that we are not the rational purchaser, the rational being that the economic model, the strict economic model wanted to believe. But in fact, we have something below our left prefrontal cortex. It's called the rest of our brain and the rest of our body. <laughs> and when situations get stressful, that those other aspects of how we think and feel and become an embodied person making decisions under uncertainty with a lot of strain, that whole reality is not just reducible to the thinking part. Again, I don't want to overstate this. I believe very much in the value of rational, sort of com com uh, contemplative uh, thinking and what you can do with analysis. I, I mean, that really is my day job. I do research. But in the practice of clinical ethics, I have to be paying attention to the emotional aspects as much or more so than any thoughts about beneficence, autonomy, justice, et cetera. Now, some would say that you're going in the wrong direction, Chris. Emotion is the enemy. The problem that we have in these situations is that emotion is running amok and we need to just basically ban it. Well, I've tried that. I've taken people into a room and I said, okay, we're going to go in here. We're going to have a very dispassionate conversation. Can you please leave all of your emotions out here? They really mess everything up. And I've learned that that doesn't really work. So that plan is out. And furthermore, why do we even give certain people like parents the moral standing is not simply biologically 
from their you know, gametes came this child, and sometimes not even their gametes, but they are raising the child, it's because of the emotional attachment, that they have real skin in the game of making sure that this person's best interests are advanced. And while they may sit there, I sometimes look at my kids and say, I love that child because I fathered him. Um, that's not usually the thought that goes through my mind. It is a more emotional, like I love him and her. I've got two boys and a daughter. Uh, I love them. We actually become distrustful of parents who don't seem to exhibit emotion towards their child. So we should be a little bit more consistent if hypocrisy is the, uh, what did you say, the essence of civilization. No, no uh, it, it certainly has a functionality to it, but I won't necessarily go that far. But I do think that we have to be consistent on this point. We want emotion to be present, and at other times we don't want it to be present. And we should just be aware that I think it's always going to be present, particularly in high-stake situations. The real enemy is appearing to be thoughtless and heartless. And I put that caveat, appearing, because often we are not these things, but we too are stressed out, emotionally overwhelmed. And because of our lack of ability to figure out how to manage that, we can retreat, take that little bit of a step back, that little bit of a lean away that parents, children pick up, that he is not fully here, engaged in whatever I am going through. And that can come off as appearing heartless, thoughtless. The solution to this often is in terms, ideas that you may have heard about, emotional intelligence, something called mindsight, which is a, a particular view of mindfulness. I think that these are crucial. Now, for the sake of time, I'm gonna move quickly. You have all these slides and I'm going to move quickly through some of this material, which could take a long time to cover. Emotional intelligence, originally talked about uh, over 20 years ago, is really a set of four different skills. The ability for me to basically be able to um, both express my emotions and be able to um, perceive what you're feeling, that there is an emotional dialogue going on between the two of us, that I can use emotion to essentially gain insight as to what is going on in a particular situation. Like when that young woman stood up and walked out of the consult, I wasn't surprised to hear that subsequently she may have had a change of heart, that there is an emotional flooding that can occur that can lead to that kind of, I'm done with this. That emotion can facilitate action and thought. How many of us have ever tried to psych ourselves up for a test? or tried to calm down before coming up to a podium to give a talk. We do this all the time. And we can also think about ways to do it before we even walk in to engage in an ethics consult. And then if we're particularly emotionally intelligent, we may also be able to, in some kind of almost action at a distance, some kind of magical effect of being able, through the way that we behave, help other people around us moderate their own emotions. And this may be mediated through mirror neurons and other ways that brains can actually perceive what other brains are perceiving and feeling. From that sort of very high concept, emotional intelligence, they have defined, psychologists and people working in this field, different ways of handling emotion that can basically, if done well, be uh, a sign of skill, listening more, talking less. I find this hard to demonstrate while I'm giving a lecture. <laughs> Although it's amazing, I'll come back to that in a minute about pausing when delivering bad news. Asking about feelings. You know, how are you feeling today? Uh, even being able to state, I can see that you're very upset. Uh, potentially getting feedback that, in fact, that's not what they're feeling or they'll be able to clarify it a kind of acknowledgement of emotions. Following up on signs of emotion or emotional distress, I was at dinner last night with somebody and you know, even at the end of the conversation, I just said, I, I've noticed you've been expressing some ambivalence about some aspect of your life. And that deepened the conversation. Complimenting people for their efforts. 
I mean, the one thing I will say about the case is I think that no matter what you viewed was going on as the right course of action, everybody was, as John said, Abraham Lincoln summed it up, they were all trying to do the right thing. We just had deeply divergent opinions about what the right thing was. And sometimes these meta statements of everybody gathered here is trying to do the right thing. And everybody goes, oh, okay, I don't have to fight over that. What we now have to do is to figure out what we're going to do collectively, and we have disagreements about that. To be able to legitimately, um, or to legitimate what other people are saying, I hear you and I can see the value. In many ways, what I took away from what John was saying is that there was a counter argument against our knee jerk reflex, which I think is the right one of, we have to tell this woman how we do it is uh, up to debate. But there were legitimate reasons to say, eh, not so sure that's the right thing to do, and not immediately push them aside as being illegitimate. And then also talk about our intention to partner, that we really want to try to work together. A dysfunctional committee, uh, I'm very lucky we have a very high functioning committee, uh, but we don't always need to come to consensus. In fact, that's one of our agreements about partnering together is that we do not need to force consensus if we don't have it. And my feedback to the consulting service after a meeting where we have divergent views that do not reach consensus is there appears to be a bandwidth here of accept acceptable ways of thinking about this, reasonable ways of thinking about it, and reasonable paths to walk. Now, I can offer you my own personal recommendation, but I cannot give you a committee recommendation other than to say, here's all within the stripes of the playing field. You've got that broader range. One of the best books I read in the last year and a half was by Dan Siegel called Mindsight, where he points out that while we're all taught that there are five primary senses, we have more than that. We have at least two more. One is the not proprioception of where am I in space, but the ability on the inner side to feel the insides of our bodies. If you ever do body scan and mindfulness meditation, you'll know that that's an odd thing to realize that you don't fully understand and you can work with, you can build. But that ability to potentially focus on what's going on in your body as you're having visceral reactions to that arousal state of, oh my God, I'm feeling tense, anxious, I'm feeling oppressed. And also the sense of what's going on in our mind, of the brain is able to perceive itself, i.e. the mind is able to get a sense of, I'm feeling sad. And we say that all the time, what sense is that? Vision, taste, touch, smell, uh, no, it's none of those. And yet we use it all the time. We're sensing something about the internal weather that we have. We just don't necessarily go about embellishing our ability to do that with um, sort of penetrating insight. If you are into thinking about thinking, and then you're into metacognition, the way that we think about how we think, and one of the ways that people think better, more clearly, uh, less likely to make mistakes is to be mindful or aware of the ways that they think. I believe that there's also meta-emotion, something I have not seen people talk about, the way that we feel about how we are feeling. So I'm sitting in a contentious meeting, an ethics committee meeting or any meeting, I will have my riled up feelings, but I've learned over time, even with a parent who's really angry with me, I can also have other feelings about my own feelings that I'm having when he is yelling at me for 15 minutes straight. And that little bit of distance between the primary feelings I'm having and these feelings about those feelings, feelings of compassion, of patience, of sorrow, of potentially compassion <laughs> having to stay there, but also compassion that he is stuck here. I can get up and leave, he can't can be very helpful. So the agenda for the 25 minutes, 27 seconds that I have is to provide you with this sort of overview introduction which I've done about why we might think of the work of clinical ethics is as much about how we remain balanced emotionally and relationally in that delicate triangle. 
as anything that we have to think about autonomy, justice, i.e., the things we typically talk about when thinking about cases. To do that, I'm going to go through these items. I'm going to spend the most time on mindfulness, uh, and then I'm going to quickly apply it to bad news, apply it to the discussion of hopes, which was hinted at earlier, and then think about how this all comes together in performance under pressure. <sighs> Wouldn't that be nice? Okay, how many of us would like something like that on a, at least every once in a while? Well, there's an app for that, <laughs> uh, literally. Uh, I will say that my own journey into doing meditation, I meditate 20 minutes to 30 minutes a day, was a kind of DIY exercise. Uh, apps helped a little bit. Um, this one is particularly good if you're trying to learn. This is the app that I happen to start with and I continue to use to this day. It keeps track of whether I'm meditating on a daily basis and I find a, it's a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of a nudge to stick with it in periods where I might get distracted. I also really benefited from books on tape. Uh, I tend to hear Pema Chodron's voice in my head when I'm trying to work through how to react to a situation. Uh, she's had many books out, this one on good medicine of why meditative practice might be one of the things we most need as clinicians. Um, she wasn't thinking of it that way, but that's how I took it. Thich Nhat Hong has some wonderful works on mindfulness meditation, uh, and I will come back to some of his most uh, important insights when we are done. If you like British accents, you can go over to England where this has become quite a big deal. Um, but the, if you really like British accents, I've got a man crush on uh, Mark Williams who reads this book with, I lived in England for a year and a half. It's just so calming and soothing. The reason I want to point to this book in particular is it's very medical in the sense that they have demonstrated with mindfulness-based stress reduction, John Kabat-Zinn's work, but then an application of mindfulness-based treatment for depression and anxiety, which is more effective, not as effective or sort of effective, but more effective than medication in preventing recurrence of episodes of depression, that, boy, it works for people who are really struggling with clinical depression and anxiety, but, you know, we live in a frantic world, and they took basically the same set of ideas and techniques and recommendations they had mapped out for the program for people with clinical depression and anxiety and turned it into, this can help a lot of people. This is where I meditate. I, my idea of flexibility is like, there, I can touch my toes. Um, I cannot sit down on a zafu or whatever they call those things. Uh, I get all uncomfortable. So I sit in a chair. I try to sit up straight, I fall asleep, I do everything wrong, uh, I sit there often with a cup of coffee in my hand, uh, trying to wake up in the morning. It has been hugely helpful to me in ways that uh, I don't want to proselytize, although here I am doing it, um, but I, I want to basically say that there's paths forward into this area if you're interested, and everybody I know who has walked down that path for a period of time has said, this really turned out to be much more helpful than I thought it would be. So what, it, what is it? You know, sort of, you sit there and chant, what do you do? Or you empty your mind and, and think nothing? No, far from it. Um, the instructions are painfully simple, uh, simple and then it turns out to be hard to execute, so that's the rub. Be aware, potentially, of an object of meditation like breathing. Try to be kind to yourself because you are not going to be able, at least I cannot, stay focused on that object of meditation for more than about five seconds. And then I wander away. And basically being kind and gentle as you discover that you don't do this very well, which is to say that you're doing it exactly right. That self-awareness of I'm losing track of what I am trying to do is the mind training that in part mindfulness is all about. And then a particular practice of Tang Len, which is breathing with people, 
Uh, so often in my palliative care world, I have to go into rooms where people are dying. There's, quote, nothing to do, and yet presence is what I should be doing. Uh, I'm a doctor, so I like to get up and check monitors and fiddle with dials and tell people what to do. So I need something to do. And what I do is I sit there and I breathe with them. And it allows me to be fully focused on what they are feeling and me trying to simply connect with them. Again, something that Pema Chodron talks about. So on a daily practice, the more formal stuff, all right, I'm going to pay attention to my breath. I sit down, I'm, I'm getting ready to go, and I'm paying attention to my breath, breathing in, breathing out. And then I notice that I'm thinking about the talk I have to give today. And I'm thinking about how difficult it will be to follow John. Um, or maybe I'm thinking about what time is it? Can I really get up to the gym before? All right, that's fine. Because then I notice that I've drifted away. And in that drifting and then the noticing of it, I can gently escort myself back to my intention. So I'm sitting in an ethics consult committee meeting I'm trying to pay attention to the range of views that are being expressed, and I'm just trying to pay attention to the range of views because I need to get a sense of whether there is any emerging consensus, and somebody says something, and boom, I'm not paying attention to the range of views anymore. I'm thinking about some particular comment. Oh, wait a second. That's not what I want to be doing right now. I want to be paying attention to the range of views. Can I come back to that? This is essentially the kind of mind training of being able to say, I have an intention. When I walk into a parent that is very angry to do an ethics consult or a palliative care consult, sometimes I teach the fellows, my only intention is to connect with them. We'll do the work that we need to do later. My only intention with this initial visit may be to connect with this dad who I've been forewarned is very angry. I just want to be with him. And I can do that for 10 seconds, 15 seconds. And then he says something, and boom. OK, I can, don't need to disregard that emotion. I don't need to disown it, but I can gently escort myself back. I'm just trying to be with him. We're going to demonstrate this. What I'd like you all to do with one accord is to say, I don't agree with you. Go ahead, everybody. One, two, three. I agree. All right. Now, I'm sure that was a little weird. <laughs> it may be counterproductive to what I'm trying to pull off here. But isn't this what we encounter all the time as ethics consultants? People not agreeing with other people? If they all agree with each other, they don't call me. So that's my daily job of, I don't agree with you, I'm really upset. I know as I sat up here and heard that, I was prepared for it. And yet still, there was a little bit of, <clears throat> Did I just make a mistake? I mean, what did I just do getting them all to say that? And for you, how, did any of you get a, a, a sort of like that's weird and an unstable feeling for just a second? This is what happens all the time when we are having earnest debate about things that matter, like whether the Seahawks are a good team or not. I mean, everybody has their button. I don't know what it would be for your, you. Trying to maintain that balance emotionally while we are juggling the fact that I've got to talk to you as the father, grandfather, daughter. I've got to talk to the patient if the patient is able to talk to. I've got to pay attention to what the nurse is thinking over there. I've got the specialist over here. And here I am trying to maintain balance. That's why this aspect of the work of doing ethics consults about emotional management, and relational balancing is key to being effective. Now, let me apply this. The bad news conversation, we're going to go very fast here. If you haven't read the book on difficult conversations, forget the rest of what I say, go buy the book, you'll be much better off. It's incredibly insightful. And what you'll find secretly embedded in it is everything that I'm talking about. They'll talk about how there are three conversations that you have to have. The conversation about the facts, that might be the thinking conversation. But then they emphasize these two other ones that we don't want to talk about because, oh my god, they're so embarrassing. And one of the big epiphanies for me, both professionally and personally, is the role of shame and how it figures in our lives. It's almost shameful to mention that I get 
all of these feelings, these messy feelings inside me, and yet they're clearly influencing the way we behave. And that that's why these conversations are difficult. And lastly is this deep inner private monologue of how am I doing? Am I doing good? Do they like me? Am I worthy? All of that is part of the difficult conversation, especially if the father is employing you. What kind of monster must you be to want to tell my poor daughter the truth that will ruin her life forever? Against that, I could see one of two reactions, either avoid it and flee or get angry and, and lean back in. And part of what our job is is to do neither of those things. In giving bad news, this is how I teach the residents and the medical students, the fellows, basically have a plan and then think about what you're going to do. And the one I want to focus on is that one right in the middle of allowing silence. I like to emphasize this by saying it doesn't mean that you need to light candles and do a seance and you know, 20 minutes of silence. I've just told you, if you don't mind, I wish the news was different. The scan shows that the cancer has come back, the warning shot and the bad news. Fifteen seconds, 20 seconds. I teach this and people say, oh, we're so pressured for time. We don't have that kind of time. All right, pardon me, this is taped. Bullshit. Okay. <laughs> You've got time for 15 to 20 seconds of acknowledging that you just gave somebody news that is going to turn their world either upside down or left turn, whatever it is, it is huge. And the emotional reactions that they're going to have that you need to honor that by not talking over it. At the same time, I've got to figure out what am I doing during that silence? Am I sitting there thinking, okay, time for silence. I wonder what the checking account balance is. Did we get paid today? No, that's not where I want to be. That's not my intention. My intention is to be with that person. I don't want to be presumptuous about what they're going through, but I just want to fully be there. This is where Tong Len can come in as just, as well as acknowledging what I'm feeling, having just been the, per the monster who gave this terrible news. And that identity, well, wait a second, I'm not the monster, it's the cancer, so, okay. These issues about how to manage that conversation, stop to make a plan, use the phrase, I wish the news was different as a warning shot, and practice in what I think of as low heat situations before I'm giving that kind of bad news. I often joke with the residents that, you know, basically I can do the whole thing of like, Oh, honey, I got some news for us. Um, we were, remember we were going to go to that lovely restaurant? Well, I wish the news was different. They called and I didn't book the right day for the reservation. Allow silence. <laughs> the point is that you can learn a lot of these techniques before you're in the high pressure situation of just what is the patter, what is it going to feel like to move through the sequence of actions before I have to do it under performance pressure. Like choreography, you're not gonna practice the dance for the first time in front of a huge audience. You wanna practice these emotional, relational, as well as cognitive activities. They're all bundled together a little bit in low pressure situations first. Hopes, something I've written about, I'm gonna draw a little bit on, on this essay. Uh, recently I was thinking even more about hope and how hopes are intimately related with fears and anxiety. The fact that we need hope when we are uncertain, when we are afraid. We don't need it when we have none of those feelings, then we just know something nice is about to happen. The deep ambivalence that we have about hope, uh, all the way back in the myth of Pandora and her jars, hope the best thing that came out of the box or in the salvation or is it the great deluder? The fact that hope is for sale and we sell it in a variety of ways, branding and advertising products, not just in the cosmetic industry, although this stuff is really good. Um, 
but all of the medical advances that we talk about. Uh, my own hospital, which I'm very proud of, I adore, Hope lives there. Uh, I've had parents tell me, not for us. Some of the key things that I think came out in the Q&A uh, after John's talk that Abby mentioned is that there is evidence that if you enable people to recognize that there's a sort of solid hope, hope for a cure, well, there tends to be other solid hopes. Oops. The hope that I won't bang up against the mic. The hope that maybe I can go home. The hope that maybe I won't have further low quality of life from the chemotherapy. The hope that I can be with loved ones. All of those concretized solid hopes that by enabling them to be brought out into the open allows people to have what I might think of more as the liquid feeling of hope or it's starting to flow through things and can find new ways of expressing itself, new ways of in adverse circumstances finding a vessel to hold it and maybe a couple of vessels. And out of that there's almost this amorphous, elusive, ethereal feeling of hopefulness that doesn't have to be latched entirely to one concrete object. And that one way to do this, if I can remain focused, is to invite them to give me a list of the things that they're hoping for, these very solid objects, and essentially help them become a little bit more liquid in the face of adversity. All of this requires essentially a mindful approach to hopeful patterns of thinking, and to become aware that in our lives we have these strong visceral reactions, emotional feelings that may make it scary to move beyond just the hope of the cure. But isn't that what I just said hope is there for, to help us confront scary things? And that part of what we can do if we remain calm, kind, both as a degree of steadiness but a degree of openness, is to enable people to say, we're not going to kill hope. We're going to kindle a variety of hopes. And then we're not talking about a false hope, a hope for cure. We're talking about, in many ways, with those miraculous hopes, a sense of parental duty that what good parent wouldn't hope that his daughter could basically be able to not have to go through any of this. It's not about false hope. It's about these other commitments and enabling them to rise up unembarrassed legitimated so that we can look at them and figure out what to do with them. Now, this conversation is very different than the bad news conversation. You can't put these together. Emotional logic tells me that if I just dropped a bomb on somebody that the cancer has come back. There are some people who are totally prepared. They want to start planning. But for most of us, our minds go blank at that point. And in the delicate triangle of thinking, feeling, and relating, the bad news conversation is best regarded and respected for what it is, the bad news conversation and the planning conversation, the what are you hoping for conversation is different. Now, let me try to put some of this together. The four suggestions are have an intention and recall it before you go into whatever you have to do. Breathe, create a kind of spaciousness, a kind of openness, and potentially also use pause and name as a way to provide emotional handles. So when you walk into a consult, how many of you think, what is the most important thing I need to do when I walk out of that room? It's the one thing I want to be able to say happened. I think many of us don't really think that way. When I do palliative care, I, I preach this to the fellows, like what's the one thing we need to do with this initial meeting. Uh, we got to go in there. Uh, we got to treat the pain. Uh, and they, they, what I see is that they really are not thinking. They just have been given a task order, a ticket from the man who makes the referral. And you run off and you go do it. And what I'm saying with this approach is I stop and I think, what do we need to most do? Now, I may be wrong. But I found that even if I'm wrong, it is helpful to be wrong and then be able, in the mix of the meeting, to realize, oh, that's not the most important thing, and I can redirect. 
You can have more than one, but just be careful. I find juggling too many items on the agenda, you're likely to get out of balance. And that this practice on the cushion, as the saying goes, or in my chair holding a cup of coffee, allows me much more quickly, when I was a high school student and then in college I did a lot of competitive athletics, and I got into some of this basically through sports performance of just how do you get into progressive muscular relaxation to go up to a foul line to shoot a foul shot. Oh, okay, I can get there much quicker because I'm trained to do it. And that's partially what mindfulness meditation does, is I can hit the pause button. Okay, I'm here, fully here, much faster than if I hadn't done that. And with that, I'm here, regain my balance, especially if I just got something thrown at me that I didn't see coming or that, that roused me. And I can decide, okay, do I want to go back to what I'm intending to do here, just connect, or just be able to feel the bandwidth of the discussion and see whether there is a common thread in all of what people are saying and that maybe I can start to move people to see that and reach consensus where we can't. Again, this is the book that I would definitely recommend about all that is going on, the flooding that occurs emotionally, and they talk about it going to the balcony of taking that distance of, hey, there's Chris doing the consult with that family. Um, seems like he's really uptight. <laughs> he's doing okay, but, you know, buddy, hang in there, of being able to both offer some reassurance, but also be able to then start to observe that maybe I'm not using appropriate body language that the family is a little bit weirded out about how I'm managing the space and I need, to, I need to back up a little bit. Or maybe I need to, in fact, as often the case with angry people, not back up, not charge them like an alpha male, but be able to show that I really feel what they are feeling, not in a adversarial way, but in a partnering, mirroring kind of way. I do a lot of promising with people especially in any encounter where I think it's going to be more than just a one and done, although even increasingly I'll do it there, that, uh, hi, I'm Dr. Futner. We haven't met. I'll be taking care of your child. Uh, a few things I, I'll tell you about myself. I'm very straightforward. I'll tell you exactly what I'm thinking. I'm not going to hide from you. If I'm worried about something, I'll tell you how worried I am, a little bit or a lot, and I'm not going to make a promise I can't keep. In the years I've done this, I've done this for a decade, I've yet to have a parent who says, no, 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 wait, 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 we don't want that. Could you please beat around the bush and dissemble? And um, <laughs> at least half of the time, if it's a kid who has any kind of complex chronic condition, has been in the hospital, they're like, thank you, that's exactly what we need. Now, when I first started to do this, like two days later, I'd be like, damn it, why did I say that I would do those things? Because it'd be a lot easier to not be straightforward to maybe omit some stuff or shade the truth, I come back to my intention, I promise them I'd be straightforward. And I often will remind them, you know, I promised you I'd be straightforward and tell you when I'm worried. And they get this big saucer-eyed look of like, oh no, that's not gonna be good. But then I'm not the adversary. They know that that's at some level what they want, and then we can work to figure out what to do about it together. Feelings as information. So I, I have a whole view, which I won't go to in a minute and 15 seconds, about how feelings do provide us with rich information about how the world is going for us. But we don't really practice after about four or five where, use your words, Jack, you know, you, you're, and you appear angry. We stop doing that at a certain point. Uh, but I put the handle back on feelings. I can see or it seems to me that we're feeling angry. I start family meetings, and this blows the residents' minds. We're here today because we're all upset and angry and frustrated. And I totally get that. I'm like, that's not a good way to start a meeting. <laughs> but immediately, once put out there, one of the things about feelings, if left unacknowledged, is that they work their biasing effects without people being able to see it. Once they become self-aware, they are much more able to figure out how to account for it those feelings. One of the things that I know we all struggle with is how to stand firm in the face of an attack, uh, an aggressive, assertive, 
We want something. We want something. I'll go back to the father who wanted a transplant, which was not going to do his daughter any good. I hear you. I totally see your point about how the care she has received has led to these complications. We're devoted to taking care of your child. We can't do this because we will kill her if we do it. We will make her miserable in the process and then we will kill her. We care so much about her. We are so sorry about what has happened to her and to your family. And I just keep repeating it. Now, I wouldn't say it quite that tersely, that, but that's what the message is. What is the work of ethics consultation? It's more than just go and learn bioethics in a classroom. Any of us who do that know that. This is the work of applying that knowledge into the clinical realm. It's managing these tensions and conflicts between people within ourselves, and it requires more than just the knowledge or a good process. And what I would end on is that these concepts of emotional intelligence and mindfulness are capacities that we have within all of us that are worth developing and building because they can benefit how we can connect to the children and to their families. Thank you.